How nice. There you are. Wow. Good morning. Look, good morning. <laughs> look at that psychedelic guitar you have. Do, 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 do. Yeah, boy, is that really great. Well, that that means that wow i mean okay i want you to tell me the story of that but i also want to introduce you because i'm so excited to have the professor of guitar and music production and engineering and psychology at the berkeley college of music it's lauren passarelli hello good morning dr richard hello hello and and the the hip thing is also that i'm sort of really excited to talk to you about is that you're a Beatles expert and since I've worked with Paul and we can we can talk Beatles things too which would be really good I would love that because I have some questions give me some real Beatles stuff <laughs> well yeah well I want I want I want to know some certain things about guitar sounds and I know you know the answer so <laughs> that's going to be fun so this is so great and and also for the audience out there in uh Richard Niles Land and Radio Richard. Uh, Lauren is a great singer songwriter and I've asked her to to play a couple of her tunes today. So I thought maybe you'd start us out with something if you wouldn't mind. Sure. Well, you know, I had this uh, little tune pop out one day while I was wishing I could make my cousin healthy. <laughs> nice. She was having a, a, a health issue and uh, I realized as I was playing it, it was soothing me. And I thought, you know, I should send this to her. In fact, I should call it Song for Susan. And I should actually notate this because I'll never remember how to play it. <laughs> and it's coming out like a little chord solo kind of a thing. Nice. So a lot of my students really enjoy it because it's in open position. And it's one of their first experiences of understanding that the guitar can play more than one note at the same time. And <laughs> a very cool revelation. <laughs> yeah. So this is Song for Susan. absolutely beautiful and i might add i i expected no less the guitar sound is absolutely beautiful too oh thanks it really sounds great and it's it's so nice to hear somebody who can actually play the thing um, <laughs> <laughs> um well and and i and i love the, that you threw in the four minor the very beatlish four minor because that's a big big uh, uh quality of beatles songs is they love four minor I know <laughs> they absolutely adore it and uh, yeah beautiful wonderful lovely um song for Susan and it's alliterative as well which is always nice it's and it's sibilant okay I'm being silly now but that's well, another no, a friend of mine did say it's like right in the right in the melody song for Susan Right, exactly, precisely. Yeah. Song for Susan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Now, 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 you need to record a version of it with a big choir of you harmonized doing those those song for Susans. Yes, with all your drop two double lead. <laughs> yes, exactly. And I hope I hope she's feeling better because of that. I certainly am. Oh yeah, yeah. She says she takes it even to the gym, and when she's doing all her 
relaxation exercises. It's the thing coming through her headphones. So nice, nice. Mission accomplished. Mission accomplished. Lovely. And and now now I need to hear the story of your guitar because it's so it's. I mean, did you do the paint job? I did. I did. This is my 1974 off-white Strat that I couldn't wait to have because of George Harrison's off-white Strat in the concert for Bangladesh. Uh -huh. I actually thought his was pure white, but under the stage lights, it looks white. Under, uh, you know, regular light, you could tell it was off-white. But over the years, from all the clothes and colors I would wear, uh, it started to change all kinds of colors. Nice. So I completely stripped it and made it natural wood and stained it. And then in 2001, it was just too sad when I knew he was very, very ill. Mm. Uh, I tried to paint similar paint job to his magical mystery guitar, Rocky. Uh -huh. Just kind of started off with some of those ideas and went crazy doing it myself because he did his himself. Really? Well, you know, I would be afraid to do anything like that because I wouldn't know what I was doing, but you do know what you're doing. And I mean, do, do you have to use, I mean, obviously you need special paint and then do you cover it with some kind of a protective lacquer or something? Well, I think a real painter might have, or ah. a guitar finishing person, but mine has a lot of actual levels. You can feel the layers of paint. And um, some people argue it was not the thing to do to a 74 Strat. But hmm. <laughs> since this is a very cool, in fact, I've never found a Strat with a thinner neck. Like this is a very small C or D neck. Yeah. Um, but, you know, most guitars that fit me per uh, perfectly because of this little distance here between the thumb and first yeah. finger, uh -huh. and one and 11 sixteenths is my max. Well, this right. guitar is one and six sixteenths at the nut. That is a very tiny neck. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I, I find that whole fascination of, of, of how big guitar necks. I mean, you can see I've got a couple of guys sitting here, but I've got I've got this new Sire Larry Carlton model guitar, which I it is just wonderful, but it's the smallest neck I've ever played in my life. What? I had no idea that three three fives had that small of a neck because I've never played one. What width is a nut? Well, you know, see now you're technical. You could tell me the exact. Thing. I don't know. I just <laughs> know it's, it's small. Yeah, that's great. You know? and, so it's and, and, well, but it's well, it's it's kind of, kind of there's certain things I can't get. So I have to, uh, you know, adapt my my playing style. I'm so glad that we I get to be a guitar nerd for for you know a while. Cause usually <laughs> I talk to people who don't don't care and don't know, but now <laughs> I get to talk to Lauren, so that's good. Yeah. So anyway, this guitar is amazing. If you ever get a chance to try one out, I strongly recommend it. Yeah. And in fact, while you were telling me about that guitar a couple months ago, um, yeah. I had happened to get a, a couple of. Uh, interesting guitars off of eBay called Wolf Guitars, W-O-L-F, and I had never Oh, heard of did you find that? <laughs> well, I liked the color of one because I'm very partial to blue, and okay. uh, this other one was a nice double cutaway, and they were so inexpensive, I thought, I'll just get both. Let me just see what they're like, because most guitars I want to try aren't available in the shops, so mm -hmm. I try a lot of things out online and just see what I like about them or whatever. And mm -hmm. I was so amazed because the store actually said, well, how would you like this set up? What kind of gauge strings would you like on it? And what string height would you like? What? You know, right. like I never had a company uh, buy, buy guitars from a company that would actually care about how I wanted to play them. And I they like them already. set up beautifully and the pickups actually sound really good. And I'm so impressed with these Wolf guitars. I well, I'm so going to check that out myself. Yeah. I'm going to do that because that's the, you know I I would I'll I'll go howling down to the, their web website. <laughs> the whole South End is howling at the moon. <laughs> yeah, how will you find them? Okay, we've done all the jokes. All right, so so now that's really great, and, and you know I really should keep guitar nerding you because I you know one thing I've always wanted to know, it's always fascinated me, is something about George Harrison. Well, and so that, that is, is ex ex I know you know the answer to this. Exactly. How did he get that trademark, instantly recognizable George Harrison slide guitar sound? How did he get it? What, what are the elements of that sound? Well, he, like I, <laughs> 
love a medium weight glass slide. Okay. And Bry Cooter had tipped him off to raise the action and put on a heavier gauge string. Mm -hmm. He often played slide on his Strat, on his Rocky Strat, in fact, the one that mm -hmm. he had all painted for Magical Mystery Tour. Mm -hmm. And um, he used a medium weight glass slide and he often double tracked it and very often he put in harmony. So, you know, what we're hearing is his fantastic touch. I mean, what I've always loved about George Harrison was his touch on guitar. Yeah. You know, Tal Farlow or Johnny Smith or, you know, Chet Atkins, they had a beautiful, beautiful touch. Yes. People and go crazy getting the same guitar, the same slide, the same amp, the same pedal, the same effects, the uh -huh. same amplifier, the same pickups, all this sure. stuff. They completely miss indeed sense of touch. And that's everything because that's your attack. And for, you know, all it's worth, you know, we're playing a plucked instrument, you know, so yeah. to play legato is really the hardest thing, yes, not staccato and fast and sloppy, you know, so yes, yes, there you yeah. go. And, and with his, um, I mean, obviously, the something solo, you know, it's just, it's a, it's a classic piece of um, contemporary art, really. But, but the, the actual sound of it is so distinctive and so creamy and i've never really heard anybody be able to get that particular it's the thickness of the sound and the yeah, yeah. and and as for the touch i i heard an interview recently with george harrison where he was saying well you know i'm i'm not really that great of a guitar player because i never practice and that's a terrible thing to tell students i never practice <laughs> but but he said you know i I practice enough to play the things I need to play. Yeah. And he says, I think I'm quite good at what I do. But I'm but I'm not I'm not a you know a technically you know advanced guitar player. And I think that's actually a good thing to tell students because it's not about how technically advanced you are, it's about how uh how you can teach yourself how to do what you need to do to express what you want to express. Yeah. And, and of course, that's something that music schools, if I may say so, don't like that attitude because they're kind of in a machine that needs to produce certain results to get to certain places. Um, so I don't know what you think of all that, but I, it's something that I think about. Well, yeah, and it's changed over the years. I can remember some of my teachers saying that Berkeley was teaching folks how to be an all around great musician that could fit into almost any situation and not self express. And then certainly after the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, <laughs> we've been about self expression sort of since. Hmm. And I guess styles and opinions change, but what you're going to do with all this stuff, hmm. all these chords and notes and knowledge and ability is still my biggest question for all my students because exactly i want to know what are you going to make with all of this why are you learning all this what is the point what, what where is all this going not that they have to have a complete formatted goal in mind but just that there's some kind of passion and reason to be working and practicing and, and doing all this there's getting some yeah. kind of immense pleasure out of it because mm. It, to me, even just the frequencies are pleasure, you know, I can just hear one chord and float away. I'm just so excited yeah. about harmony and playing a chordal instrument, you know, like in, in high school and junior high school, it was like, well, if you want to play guitar in the stage band, you have to be in the concert band, you have to be in marching band. So what are you going to play now? And so I picked up flute. <laughs> completely blew my mind at 15 years old that you needed three float flutes to make a chord <laughs> oh, yeah yeah that's a that's typical to play even if you're uh Rashan roland kirk <laughs> <laughs> and so uh you know to me the last 30 years or so where everybody wants to play lead guitar and not play chords is so disappointing because there's only a few instruments on the planet that can play polyphonically you know yes. so why yeah. are you playing this monophonically i i don't understand it but but beyond that i kind of wanted to talk to you about the whole concept of well there's two sides that you touched on what are you going to do with it but also what are you going to do with it to actually earn a living and then there's the other thing of what are you going to do with it artistically so i think there's always the, those two things art and commerce are always balanced 
Yeah. Uh, but I, I, um, I find it frightening to think of <laughs> the many thousands of guitar students and music students who are coming, uh, being belched out of v different colleges. And I, I, of course, think Berkeley holds a special place. It's not just your ordinary music college. But nevertheless, all of these v hundreds of thousands of students are coming out. And the, the, because of what's happened to the business, uh, and because of what's happened to technology, the chances of them actually earning a living are less and less and less. So mm -hmm. I, I don't know how much you talk to your students about those types of things. Well, they don't ask, <laughs> which is interesting. And um, while they're there, that's not necessarily their question, you know, um, and that's okay because there's certainly enough reason to play and to create music and to satisfy your artistic side that will completely align your mood and train your brain to be in a better place so that you're a better human being on the planet of course that alone will attract really good opportunities whether it's in music or something else mm. but the thing i do try to say is don't necessarily put the pressure on your art to make a living because that really dampens things and really spins things off into headache land sometimes for folks because there are so many easier ways to actually make a lot of money you know you oh go, right yeah definitely so so why put that kind of pressure on your music your music could be something that you're doing on the side it could be do something that you do in conjunction with it, it, you know it they're not uh intrinsic to each other they're not exclusive from each other it could do any way you want to create that life is, is yes. going to be okay but you'll find your way everybody does yes everyone does and but you know i find this strange kind of thing i mean i've i haven't done anywhere near as much teaching as you have i've taught in a few actual <laughs> institutions colleges and things and i've done a lot of master classes and i've done a lot of private teaching and what I find is when I've taught in schools, yes, that's you back there, look at that. Uh, <laughs> um, I found that when I teach in schools, I've been very, I've been a bit frustrated because every time I've been in a situation like that, I, I get complaints, you're asking us to do too much work. <laughs> now, when I was at Berkeley, which is, you know, back in the dark ages before you were born, I never heard anyone even breathe something like that. It, every student that I was there with, which was a pretty hip combination of students, I can tell you, mm -hmm. you know, they just said, give me more, give me more. What what else can I do? I, yeah. And, and to, you, know, I, you know, they couldn't get enough and I couldn't get enough. And I came at it from a very weird situation where I had, had never had uh, uh, real music training before I went to Berkeley, which was, wow. yeah, a lot so of people don't. So you're one of those that sort of started. Uh, get... I couldn't read. I mean, I could just barely read. I knew where the notes were, but I had taken the three months of guitar lessons from, from some guy before I hit Berkeley. I'd wow. been playing for a couple of years and I'd grown up with music from my father. But, you know, he was not a great teacher. And, and also, I didn't grow up with him. I kind of grew up. That's too complicated to go into. Anyway, <laughs> the, point, the point is that when I got to Berkeley, I, I had a letter from a great musician called Buddy Bregman, who was working with my parents. He was an arranger from Hollywood arranger from the 50s and 60s and stuff. And so he wrote a letter saying, I think this kid is really talented. He doesn't know what he's doing, but it's, it's really quite interesting and you should take him. So they took me in and they said, okay, you have to, we'll let you stay for the first semester, but if you don't get a B plus average, we're, we're going to kick you out. <laughs> so I didn't mind that too much because I really wanted to work. And of course I had an A average and they let me stay. Uh, so that was that and and i you know the first year was really tough i did nothing but memorize 
scales and arpeggios and chords and whatever. But after that, it clicked in and, and, and the teaching methods of Berkeley were so great. But why I'm talking about myself, I don't want to. But what I do want to talk to <laughs> is that other colleges that I've been teaching at and other places, they've said, don't give them too much work and you can't fail anybody, you know, and yeah. which is just crazy. And I said, How, but what if they're doing no work? Well, you, you know, they've got to pass because otherwise we lose students and we can't pay our bills. So that that kind of depressed me. So I, I, I must say I do prefer teaching privately because then you're talking to somebody and you know what they're what they're doing. But um, I and mean, grades, which is nice, you know, yeah. And do you do you have do you feel amongst the students and you've been doing this for a long time that the hunger is still there the passion for the music is still there. It depends on the person sure and and it's the luck of the draw I mean sometimes you get a semester full of very passionate students and, and sometimes it's a mixture and. Uh, the last couple of years it's been very strange because folks weren't used to being back in circulation again. They were used to doing things on Zoom and really checking out and not really showing up or not really doing much work. And so right, it has right. been hard to sort of jumpstart their interests again. But uh, Berkeley's always been the college that even when it was a family owned business just starting off, uh, it yeah. prided themselves as it, taking anybody who had an interest and teaching them the correct way to be a real right. musician. And it's not just you're a guitar player, it's you're a musician. Oh yeah, guitar. and so uh, I love that Berkeley just teaches you the instrument, whatever <laughs> instruments you're choosing, and you can do anything you want with it. Exactly, and as I as I famously said to Mr. Matheny in, in the book that I uh, wrote uh, uh, of interviews with him, uh, I made the point that his his sort of thing has always been that the guitar is an instrument like a fork. And that you you know you use it in order to do something. Hmm. So, so a lot of people get wrapped up. He was saying a lot of people get wrapped up in the instrument itself, mm -hmm. and, and the instrument starts controlling what you play, which yeah. is you know, and what you just played is such a beautiful example of of playing the music and making your instrument do that thing, and figuring out the best way that that beautiful instrument can play the thing that you want it to play. And I think a, a lot of people are kind of stunned by that, that thing, because they're very into, you know, that uh, wanting to shred. <laughs> uh, well, I, I think guitar can function in a band in so many different ways. And uh, Berkeley hasn't really embraced the singer songwriter way of playing a guitar. And a lot of people out in the world think that if you are a singer songwriter, then you don't play guitar well, but that's not true either. Oh, that's you know? so untrue. So, I mean, Paul Simon and James yeah. Taylor, I have those two words to say to you. Yes. And, and they're, they're my, uh, certainly very big influences for me. Yeah. I mean, those guys are, I mean, some of the best guitar playing you'll ever hear is, is listening yeah. to them play. Yeah. And the Beatles, of course, getting... Oh, of course, yes. Let's not forget them. Three guitar players in that band. <laughs> yes, exactly. And, and, um, and, and McCartney, I think, is another great example of the idea of it's only an instrument. Because no matter what he plays, it's, he plays McCartney. Yes. And, uh, and him. Yeah. he has that phenomenal uh, facility. And I, when I worked with him, uh, that was something that was always so impressive to me about how instantly he could pick up any instrument and do something that was really remarkable you know, <laughs> not just not just playing something but really how did he do that or what what is oh that's an interesting way to go from that chord to that chord and I, I mean he just had that that naturally but it also you know he likes to say oh I'm completely uneducated I don't know what I'm doing I don't read music I don't you know that would slow me well the truth is that's not true because harmonically he knows exactly what he's doing and you know when he's I you know, I worked with him for a year and he would say, oh, no, we go to the G minor six there. And he, he would be able to say that he doesn't want anybody to know that uh, because it's kind of tarnishes the image of the, you know, the kind of genius thing. But but it's absolutely the true. The reason he knows it is because the Beatles grew up playing their parents music when exactly. they wanted to be musicians. 
it was be an entertainer and it was play the music of the day. And mm. so they were playing music from the 40s, the 30s, the 20s, the 50s. You know, they were just playing all these songs that happened to be written by fantastic composers and lyricists exactly. that knew chords, that had the biggest box of crayons, you know? Like yeah. when we were in grade school, we wanted the biggest box of crayons, not just a couple of primary colors, a couple of sure. power chords or something. So a lot of young people are afraid of those colors because they haven't heard them in their favorite band's music. People haven't been using them. People haven't even been using guitar in the last 30, 40 years very much in, in popular music. So that's been disappointing. Well, well, not the original thing. Hmm? You say they haven't been using guitar. I think you mean they haven't been using it in an original way. Yes, in, in, in arrangements or even standing out in the band. So people are thinking like guitar isn't important. We could just program a drum groove and throw a synth line in there and it's okay. But the, the thing I love most about Paul is his self-permission as an artist. As, as an experimenter, as a curiosity seeker, as a, I want to please myself and I want to hear the sounds I want to hear and I'm going to find a way to make them. And if I can't make them, I'm going to hire somebody who can. You right, know? And exactly. so we admire this self-permission in so many ways. Like when he takes to the stage and he's walking around carrying one of those flags of whatever country he's in, it's almost like he's a superhero. He's like the best of what human beings can aspire to because okay. of that self-love and self-permission that some people get upset with him for like why doesn't he go away or why why is he still uh doing what he's doing it's like he loves it Absolutely. i love when he turns around and says what i'm gonna stop because of you, you know? yeah, exactly exactly <laughs> well even when he was 30 you know people were saying uh well you're a bit past it now don't you think and yet when the four of them came in 1964 the world wasn't about four young men in a band no, it wasn't. No. Guitar was on its way out. They were turned down by every major label twice. And older people with crew cuts ran the world. You know, right. and they weren't accepting of these young guys. Ever mm -hmm. since the Beatles, every major label is like, where's the next four Beatles? Where's the next four Beatles? It's never a formula. It's yeah. never a, this is the reason it worked. And it's, it's never about the next. Yes. That's a you know, ridiculous. Once, I think the biggest thing that's happened since the Beatles wasn't even in music. I think it was the Harry Potter books. <laughs> well, that's a very fascinating concept. Yes. And J.K. Rowling was a gigantic Beatles fan and she loved, loved, loved George Harrison. So there's something about that torch and that permission and that do your own thing your way that she also got from them. Yeah. So, well, you know, and, and a lot of my students say to me, I, you know, I'm always urging them to, you know, he, here are some ways to find your own voice. Here's here's something you can try. Here's something else you can try, you know, if, for people who haven't found their own voice. And of yeah. course, Pat Metheny's uh, edict is follow what you love. What music do you love most? Yes. Okay. And then ask yourself the question. I, t I tell my students to write it down. Write down exactly what it is you love about the music you love or about the songs that you love or the lyrics you love, which, you know, what is it about it? Don't just say, I love it. Say why, mm. you know, it's kind of like, you know, having a relationship. I, I, I want, I want some proof here that you love me. I don't want you just to say, I love you, <laughs> you know? Uh, did, you ever, so, did you ever hear my uh, playing along with Pat's record? It's for you that, that uh, audition I had to do for him. No, I didn't. That's hysterical. It's on my YouTube channel. Well, that, I'll listen to it. Yeah, well, Gary Burton was president of Berkeley at the time. Yes. And I'm walking through the guitar department in the 1140 building one day, and there's a sign on Larry <clears> Bale's <throat> door saying, Pat Metheny's going on tour, and he needs a rhythm guitarist. If you want to apply to audition, you know, you have to play along with one of these songs and, Man. you know, make it sound like the record. And I just Man. walked by it for a few days. And friends of mine were saying, are you nuts? You're not going to apply for this? It's like, exactly. you've got one of the best grooves in the business. And I was like, well, I'm not a jazz musician. So they're like, he's not looking for someone to be him. He's looking for someone to play a groove behind him. And you, exactly. play groove. And you love playing exact voicings and doing exact record copies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love that, you know? So I had met Pat a couple of times before that at different uh, small jazz clubs in Cambridge. And then he came to talk to the guitar department. And because we had set a low prior to that, 
I went over to speak to him when a lot of the other faculty weren't even talking to him because they were like scared or something. <laughs> and he was telling me how much he loved the Beatles and that he had seen A Hard Day's Night 25 times. Did he yeah. ever tell that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we talked a lot about the Beatles. He wanted to be a Beatle. He loved George Harrison's playing. Mm. Yeah. So then, you know, the stories in my video on my YouTube channel where I'm playing along with his record, It's For You, and trying to play the exact grooves and stuff. Nice. Nice. That was fun. I, I must look at that. Yeah. I think the, other, the other interesting thing is that um, where education can encourage people to, as you said many times, explore, try something different. Try, mm -hmm. no, because I, I, I fear that listening to music, and I don't just mean uh, pop music or jazz music or singer songwriter music, I find that there is a kind of homogenized conformity to a great deal of it. And um, that my favorite thing to hear, and probably yours too, is when you hear something and you say, wait, what was that? I haven't heard that before. I love that experience. That's my favorite experience. And yet, there's so little of it in, I mean, I search around the media. I, I listen to lots of YouTube channels. I listen to the radio. I listen to whatever's happening. And I don't hear that much that hits me in the forehead and says, wait, this is something, wow, this is, a, I've never heard anybody do that. You know, and well, two things that I've liked recently over the years has been Snarky Puppy. Yeah, and, uh, I just saw the play, the touring production of Hades Town, and the music in that has some beautiful melodies and exquisite harmony. Like mm. I couldn't believe those kinds of songs were being written for a play, but it mm. turns out it was the singer songwriter Anais Mitchell. <laughs> writing the songs and they made a play around her song. So it explains why those melodies are so great. But I'm right. so happy that young people were flipping out over this play because Thanks. again, melody was coming back into focus. Indeed. Yeah, yeah. And and uh so I mean I, I'm not I'm not saying at all that there isn't anything great out there because there is a lot of great stuff out there. But it's just that not too much of it uh seems um original in intent or wanting to say something new. Um, well, you can I'm realize also... too, when people are saying something in an original way, they're not thinking up, how can I be original? How can no. I be different? How can I just take the world by storm? It's like your originality is already built into you. You already have your own DNA, your own fingerprints, your own greatness is already there, like an acorn, you know, like you just have mm -hmm. to let that blossom and let that turn into something good. And, yeah. uh, even the Beatles weren't ever looking like we're going to really conquer the world. I mean, being oh, the top of most of first, book, it was a bit of a joke, you know, <laughs> it was yeah. just trying to cheer themselves up, but really they just wanted the next rung on the ladder. I just want a better gig. I would just like a gig. I would like to just make a record. I hope we can get on that little tour. I hope we can get on that TV show, you know, yeah. and it was just one step at a time. Yes, indeed. And I, I also, um, I, I loved, um, I didn't get a chance to study with Mick Goodrick, sadly, but I loved what he did with a lot of his students where the lesson would be they'd go to the window and look and he'd ask his student to just look out the window and tell tell him what they were looking at and what <laughs> was interesting. <laughs> there. And and that, of course, was the key to them finding themselves. You know, one person might concentrate on a puppy going mm. by and another person might concentrate on some you know attractive person going but you know they have or what a beautiful tree that is so they different people will be led to and he'd say well that's what it is now play that you know it was funny he was doing all this mentoring with all the different guitar teachers who were ever interested to study with him yes this was back in the mid 90s yes he overheard me talking to another teacher saying you know i just worked with sandra cott of the boston pops and she came over to play violin on one of my songs and I had written down the melody, but I didn't put in any of the bowing. And when she sat down to play it, she said, well, how would you like me to phrase this? And she phrased it 14 different ways and each one yeah. had a different emotion. Absolutely. And my jaw was on the floor because if you'd yeah. put those notes and those rhythms in front of any guitarist, they'd be like, dink, 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 da, dink, 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 that's the melody. Yeah. Really yeah. that's what's there. And there yeah. was so much more there. So he came over to me and tapped on my shoulder and he said, 
I want to study with you. And I was like, oh, God. <laughs> oh, no. So we, we worked on things for three semesters, but you know what he would do? Even if I ever I'd ask him to like teach me things and all this stuff, he'd say, just play some more of your songs. I love your voice and I just want to hear more of your songs. And I just couldn't believe it. It's like, come on, this is Mick Goodrick. There's a lot yeah. you could be teaching me, right? And he didn't want to do that. And then when he's, you know, I said to him when I was playing some things live for him, you know, I never even took any composition classes when I was at Berkeley. I I just sort of feel around the neck and I just can just tell that this note wants to go here and this one wants to go up and this one wants to go down. And I right. just, whether I'm in standard tuning or all the different alternate tunings that I write in, I just follow my emotion and write whatever I want to write. And he said, that's how you're supposed to write. Yeah, that's that's kind of, that's kind of it. And I mean, <laughs> you'll you'll you'll, uh, you'll get a lot of laughs out of my new book, which is I'm going to plug now, which is <laughs> it's called it's called uh, Adventures in Jazz Composition. And in it, again, what I'm doing is I throw a lot of candy out there. Oh look, you could get that. Oh look, it's a puppy. Oh look, you know. And and I I'm trying to say to people. Yes, of course, there are kind of there's a theory of composition and there's you can you have to understand music theory and you have to understand the possibilities. But it, I, I, what I show is that every possibility has 14 other possibilities. <laughs> Just one every every kind of rule or every system has 12 other systems you could invent based on that, because my whole system of composition is if you can do that, well, then why can't you do that? <laughs> well, and and then and then the second thing that you've invented but then why can't you do that and so that's that's my feeling about it and i love that he said that because he's absolutely right of course <laughs> you you're, you don't study to be something else you study to be yourself mm. um i wanted to also talk to you about because of that what you feel are the pressures therefore on musicians who do want to earn a living when they're faced with the realities of what's happening in technology now, and especially the fact that the main system of delivery of music is streaming, where music is so rigidly kind of codified and and uh, and uh, put into little boxes. I mean, do you do you think about that kind of thing? Well, a lot of us older folks do miss the product. You know, like it was really fun to save up a little bit of money and go get your new album and listen to it, uns yep. you know, unceasingly for three months so that you mm -hmm. knew that album inside and out. You could read all the credits, you knew all the players, you knew who arranged it, you knew who engineered it, you knew who produced it. I mean, it was a big deal to have something physical from that artist. And we had it for a little while with the CDs and cassettes and things, but to get it down to something so digital now where there's nothing physical to sell and nobody's making much money off the streaming. That's, no. that's sad. Uh, <laughs> as far as technology though, I mean, you look around, you see, I have a lot of recording toys and stuff. I'm always fascinated with technology. I've always loved playing with tape recorders and microphones since I'm 11 years old. So, I'm not against technology per se, and I certainly wasn't one that would ever think I'd be using a computer so much even, because in the early days, the computer screens were kind of glaring and they would hurt my eyes and such, but that's become the tape recorder, you know, to use yeah. logic. Indeed. And now, even just us talking, being able to do this while you're in California and I'm in Massachusetts, I mean, it's fascinating what technology has provided. So. I feel like any really cool independent thinker and cool artist can find a way to use the technology to their advantage and create something wonderful with it that's unique to them. And it'll just be another tool. I don't think it's anything to fear. Well, I, I agree with you. And, and being just a couple of years older than you, uh, I, <laughs> I find that, uh, you know, I've watched it go from, I mean, I started uh, as a professional in 75. And if you think about where technology was then, I mean, we were just in London, when I started in the studios there, a lot of the studios were still 16 track in 75. And, and uh, I knew I came out of Berkeley, sadly, knowing zero about recording studios, because I, 
I had recorded in them, but I, you know, I didn't have time to take those courses. I wanted all the composition courses. There and, weren't many in those days either. Yeah, and you, I think you, there was a studio there, a yeah, small one. studio, <laughs> uh, one, and and uh, and that was, you know, I I so I didn't know what I was doing, but I had to learn by doing. And yeah. so every every time I worked in the studio, and I was uh, working in the studios very quickly after I got out of Berkeley. I mean, within how three months. How did that all start? See, that's why I always wanted to interview me for my YouTube channel. <laughs> well, that, well, I, I'd be we glad. Can, we could use that. this video in both places then. Yeah, that's right. I'm, I'm happy to do that. So, but, yeah, tell me, how, how did you even get started in like the real music business, working with real artists? Well, I came out of Berkeley and my intention was, all I really wanted to do was write songs and produce songs and and uh, arrange songs but mainly i wanted to write and i and of course i was i was a jazz guy but i was also a heavy you know i loved pop and i loved certain artists you know very much and and I, so i had a very wide desire so my when i got to london where my mother and stepfather were my mother and stepfather were screenwriters uh working in london so <laughs> <clears throat> Thank you. That was a little beep. I don't know what that was about, but anyway, um, you got an email. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You're, I'll do it. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and my mother said to me, "Well, you know," I said, "I'm going back to New York or L.A. I'm probably going to go back to New York. That's where I want to go get started, and uh, <clears throat> I'll try to meet some people and do what I can." And she said, "Well, what? Look, you're in London. It's a major place for for the business. Why not go see a few people?" So Paul McCartney, uh, you're all right. <laughs> I, I went to 25 different companies. I wrote down, I made a list. And in those days, of course, we didn't have the internet. I had to just really, yeah, I, I made a list of the, the music companies that I could. And I asked people and I called 25 companies and 24 of them said, sort of. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> And but one of them, one guy at a publishing company was very nice, <clears throat> a guy called David Barnes, and he said uh, he was a publisher at Essex Music, and he he really liked an idea that I had for a musical. I wrote a musical. I, I wrote some songs. I wanted to write some songs for a musical uh, about the female pirates Anne Bonny and Mary Reed. I don't know if you know about them, but 1724 um it, it's a whole story it's a very interesting story too um <laughs> women weren't even allowed on the ship you know so to have two female pirates it was kind right. of a thing. so um uh, he liked the idea and he said well you know if you ever write anything on that i really like the idea and i really like your music and i played him a few things i had recorded at berkeley just you know with a cassette machine mm -hmm. uh and uh with you know from some friends of mine he said it's really great but you know come back so four weeks later I walked into his office with a complete script for a musical and 14 songs and he was kind of impressed by that plus he liked the music and he actually signed me to the publishing company right. so that was interesting and then and then of course nothing happened with the musical because getting a musical on is like <laughs> jumping off of Everest and living you know it's not it's not really a smart idea so <laughs> But but one of the producers at the publishing company said to me, oh, you can write for strings, can't you? And I said, well, yes, I can. Now, remember at Berkeley at that time, you didn't have any strings. You couldn't hear it. If you wanted to have it heard, you'd have to go to BU. And it was a big schlep and it was just too. But but, but I, I knew how to write for strings. And he said, well, I've got a guy. I'm producing a record, a, a disco record for this Lebanese guy. And it's a and I thought disco, you know, some disco I like, most of it I hate. Tell me, you know, and he said, well, the guy's willing to pay you four hundred pounds cash. Now four hundred pounds <laughs> cash in 1975 was yes. a goddamn of a lot of money. I mean, <laughs> it's it's it was at least I mean four thousand pounds, maybe more than that, right? So I said yes, yes, I'll do it, I'll do it, and from that one session um other people for the musicians on the session started recommending me to other people i got gigs from that and i got gigs from 
more gigs from that producer and word spread really quickly. And within a very short time, um, I was working with Cat Stevens, which was a great pleasure for me because I had really loved his music. I mean, you know, as I say, Paul Simon, James Taylor, and Cat Stevens, you know, and so that was that was a big thing. And then very quickly after that, uh, I got to work with people like Leo Sayer and David Essex and people at the time, you know, who were having wow. things going on. So so that that grew. If I could just jump in there and just point out what's so cool about that for students today is a lot of folks just think all these faces that say, I don't know anything, I don't have to know anything, I don't really play, my band just plays, or I don't have to produce, or I don't really have to know anything about recording, or I don't really have to know anything about arranging, all that stuff. Somebody has to know. If you're really going to get your project off the ground, there's going to have to be somebody that you hire that knows. Absolutely. <laughs> And you Absolutely. need, you know, it's like when I audition <clears throat> bass players or something, and if a bass player says, oh, uh, it's a G major seven over E, <laughs> you know, or G major seven over B, is it okay if I play the low G? It's like, next, you know, like you just, you have to know, you know? Yes. So somebody's going to really arrange it. Yeah, and, and, and that was the whole point of my, my book, uh, The Invisible Artist, was to show how yeah. arrangers who know, they're the guys who know and the women who know, uh, because that somebody's got to know the music itself. Somebody has to play the damn song. <laughs> and, and most people don't, most artists don't. And this is another reason why I say, I don't think it's a good idea when most artists produce themselves, because you've got the opportunity to have somebody who you respect giving you their input yeah. And, you know, if it's a if it's a, a a kind of a loving input, if it's a kind of artistically um, respectful input, wow, how great that is to have. Well, someone uh, to help expand you and bring out the best, not yeah. just you off, you know, into another ditch someplace. You right. Know? And, I, and I'm the guy who always says, that's great. But what if we did this? Mm -hmm. And I let the artist hear it and they say, oh, yeah, that's better. OK, let's do that. Yeah, and, and, and that's the big you, thing. And it wasn't just you putting in your two cents so that your name's on it or that it goes in the direction you want. It's actually something that really uh, lifts the song to a new new musical. Level. And that's always the point. That's always the point to lift yeah. the song and and to clarify the intent of the artist. Yeah, because you know if you sing something, I'll say I know what you want to say. I understand it. But you mm. could say it better with this little soft piece of velvet right here. Yeah. You could say it better with with a you know, uh, whatever it is, and 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 so that's that's the whole beauty of making music together. Because I also, I mean, I can see your beautiful room there, which mm. I would love to spend a, about you know a month in there. But mm -hmm. I but I also think it's even more fun to go into those rooms together and, and say, hey, what, let, wait, oh, wait, wait, what about that? What about, you know, that's the fun part. And so yeah. um, for me, that's the thing. And, and also that's the way that when I got to England, I noticed that people were coming up with these new sounds. Of course, the 70s was in, in I think in a way, the, uh, the kind of 60s grown up you know, all the hip stuff of the 60s, which they couldn't really do too well. Now we're getting that extra sort of polish and sheen from from a lot of hip people. So I think that was the fun of it, to see all this new technology coming in and, and using it to make music. Well, you got to remember too, with the Beatles, they had a fantastic team around them. Oh, the finest yeah. recording engineers, the best producer, and what made George Martin Sir George Martin, such an amazing producer. He was a fantastic arranger. Exactly. Thank that you was very what much. Did it. Yeah, and I loved your book. I, I took it out of the library, and uh, there was a, a couple of your other books I took out of the library. You, you make, you know, fantastic points. I don't know if people will always cherish the things that you and I cherish, but that doesn't matter either because your values and your musicality will always be something special to somebody you know and it doesn't yeah. matter if it is to everybody i mean i think I, yeah, yeah what's interesting about guitar though is that 
guitarists and piano players are taught to be virtuosos. So you're always practicing and you can do your own thing. It's very self-contained. But drummers and bass players are always looking to play with each other and looking to play with other instruments, you know, so they come up with more socialization <laughs> in band situations more often. And yeah, that's a good point. I've never heard anybody mention that, but that's a really good point. If I had been surrounded by people who were producers and arrangers, I would have loved to have had company at a much earlier age. I do a heck of a lot more collaboration now and record for a lot of other artists and mix for them and such. But um, I've always enjoyed working as a team. It's just, I also knew starting to write songs at 10 years old that this was something I just stumbled on. And there were so many songs pouring out of me that I, I knew I should just learn how to play with the gear because this would be too expensive to have to go to a studio every time I want to hear something that's in my head. And mm. I could hear so many ideas. So I would just record tons and tons of guitar parts, you know, with cassette to cassette and then quarter inch reel to reel four track and then a half inch eight track. Sure. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. And then <clears throat> and all this stuff. But the whole point was I needed a dream machine to play all my ideas back and hear them at once. And uh in those days, those things didn't exist. So oh. again, technology advancing caused all those things to become less and less expensive and more and more cool gear being possible for the consumer. Yes, yes. and I, you know, I, pretty much, I, I mean, everything about technology that has developed and will develop way more mm. is great. The one, the one aspect that I think has uh, kind of made made it more difficult for musicians to earn a living is the the method of delivery because when they first of all i mean the cd came in and when the cd came in uh i i've told this story before i i spoke to the head of emi and i said wait a minute you know i'm in the studio all the time are you making these cds you are putting copy protection on them aren't you and mm -hmm. they said Oh, no, it would take another six or eight months for that. And we want to release it now. And I, I said, but he said, oh, nobody will be able to copy CDs. It's way too expensive. They, I mean, they'd have to go to a recording studio to do that. Don't be ridiculous. And I said, I'm telling you, I work in the studios every day. People will be copying CDs and they'll be worthless soon. Hmm. And he said, oh, well, you know, he says, that's that's be why you are a musician and I'm the head of this company. <laughs> but, um, so, but um, and and you know <laughs> six or eight months later the uh, they found the out but anyway the point is uh now we have this streaming thing where music is pretty much free hmm. and and so it does make it more difficult and 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 i'm hoping that since live music is the only way that people can actually make any kind of a fee for playing music that that will get larger i'm i'm hoping that that thing of having no mm. place to play you know there are more clubs and more cafes and more places where people can can play live because uh i i certainly think that's one of the most beautiful aspects of music and also one mm. of the ways that people can actually earn a living i mean do you do much live playing i did before the pandemic sure okay I've i mean because i know you were in you were in that beatles group I yeah I've toured for years probably good uh, seventeen years between two tribute bands one doing the Beatles music from nineteen sixty three to nineteen seventy oh. and then found on the internet another band got in touch with me and I was doing uh, the solo Beatle years where there were seventy more number one hits and seven hundred more songs That's to right. learn That's right That's right. <laughs> So, you know, all those great songs were really fun, but I was always doing uh, solo guitar and vocal kinds of gigs and, uh -huh. um, you know, early, early days, certainly tons of restaurant gigs and hotel lounge gigs, singing and playing right. live jukebox and such. It, okay, so here's my question. If you had to do a gig tomorrow night and you had to, you, you were playing with a bass player just just a bass player and you uh at what 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 guitar and what amp would you take with you i'd probably take a strat and and a little fender amp yeah <laughs> which, which one how well, the... i've been really liking this princeton reverb wow okay I got a trade recently so yeah it's probably not gonna 
need to be too big and too loud. And if it's in a bigger place, they can always reinforce it in my case. Yeah. Uh-huh. Do you have do you have a super duper pedal board? I did. I got rid of all those things when I stopped touring with those bands. Um, there was all kinds of sound alike things and automatic uh, MIDI step on any pedal, change the sounds four times within one song kind of capability. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I was doing all the line six stuff because they yeah. did variaxes and the James Tyler variax was very helpful because you but could what would you use tomorrow night? I mean, what would you take tomorrow night? I would just probably bring a regular strat and I have a couple to choose from. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. so you've not, not a lot of effects. You wouldn't take much. Uh, probably not. Um, you know, maybe a chorus, you know, if I'm just playing with a bass player, I'm just accompanying myself. So I wouldn't need all the different distortions and all those cool things, but. Mm -hmm. the drives. No, it's just always it's a question I always ask people because it's quite funny because you know some people would say, "Oh well, I take my Marshall stack and I, you know." Yeah, yeah. Well, people yeah. are loving that things are getting so much smaller now. You know, nobody wants to lug around the stuff. So yes, well, I I hate to give them a, a plug, but I mm -hmm. I actually have been gigging with the Spark Forty. There you go. Dude, have you have you tried that out? No. But for a while, oh. I was using my little Honer Steinberger copy, which looks like a little paddle. It was this big, and I'd travel yeah. on planes with that. And then I'd use all the amp simulations from Agile Partners that was in my right. phone and plug okay. in the yeah. thingy, and my phone was my preamp. That's it. And that's so exactly the how, the spark, that's how the spark works, because I just take that, and in, in my phone, I can get 7 billion different sounds. That's it. You know, yeah. so that's great for traveling, for sure. And I asked them, I asked them, uh, you know, it's, is there any way that I could plug the, that amp into another amp? Why is there no output? And they said, oh, we don't want it to be used live. We don't what? want it to be used. I know, I thought that was crazy. Wow. I thought it was absolutely crazy. So you know, I just put a mic in front of it, but if I have to. But anyway, that's all beautifully interesting. And, and uh, I would love it if you would, sing us another song or play us another song or do whatever you want to do sure well um it was interesting you know speaking of paul mr mccartney sir <laughs> he <laughs> had enjoyed his trying to play box beret playing voicings in tenths and when he wrote blackbird yes he and george harrison loved that song but liked the double ness of that arrangement because it's interesting to play on the guitar and wow. they only knew the tune so far so paul just said well i'll write my own you know and so he said why don't i find another way to accompany myself like that on an acoustic when he was working on his chaos and creation in the backyard album and for mm -hmm. that album he wrote a song called jenny wren and when i heard that story that he wanted to revisit that accompaniment style that's one of those kinds of things I do in my songwriting guitar lab. It's like we can get in from a variety of stories and lyrical aspects or a title that can spark off some thoughts for lyrics, but the guitar itself can offer all these starting off places. And this voicings intense idea was really appealing to me. So I thought, why don't I play with a lot of those shapes? You know, you have all those. And you just put your fingers anywhere and find all these shapes, right? So I came up with uh, a progression I really loved, and I uh, wanted it to be a, a lullaby for my niece, who was one years old at the time. Her name is Bella, so I called it Bellaby. So this nice. this is Bellaby with all the voicings and tenths, thanks to Sir Paul. <laughs> Bye. 
say how say very beautiful well lauren passarelli this is your life no i mean it's been <laughs> so great to have you is all right, now oh wait before i leave i want to ask you tell me about what your new projects are i just finished an album called snow cake and uh it felt like it achieved some of the new recording techniques and things i've been learning from all the cool places it's i mean that's the greatest thing about technology has been youtube <laughs> and yeah. all the things that you can learn and, and grow from and and the friends you can make all around the world out there indeed yeah well one of, the, one of the things i like about uh writing songs that uh was interesting about Bellaby too was that uh you have a choice when you go to write a melody is your melody going to follow the top notes of your chords and the voicing the voice leading or is it going to go something contrary and it was right. fun that, that one stayed with it you know? yes yes and very nice too. And you have an unusual little chord up there. Uh, I can't remember what it was, but you have a, a beautifully, slightly unexpected chord that when you get up high and yeah. it's just great. And I think that makes the song very special. Well, I think that's what's so cool. You know, there's a woman named Susan G. Wooldridge who wrote a book called Poem Crazy and another one called Fool's Gold. And she encourages people to play with words like they're blocks, like you can move them around in the sentence and put things all over the place. And mm -hmm. meaning will take care of itself because that's what human beings do. We make sense out of chaos. Yes. So it's the same with chords and shapes. I mean, I was telling my kids, you know, you can put your fingers anywhere and make up chords. Or so you think you're making up chords, but you're literally coming up with things that make sense because you're part of the fabric of life and you've heard music your entire life. You're going to do things that you've heard and you're going to yes. do things that you like. And the chord meaning will even take care of itself. And I love when I go to write these things down. It's like, wow, there's a minor six in there. Wow, there's some augmented chords. Oh my goodness, look, I put a diminished thing in there. You know, yeah. it's, it's so interesting to me because my sensibilities and growing up in the 70s heard a lot of fantastic music from Chicago and Stevie Wonder and Yes, sure. and, uh, you know, the Allman Brothers and the Beatles and right. James Taylor and all these fantastic composers, Carly Simon, you know, fantastic writers and not shy of using any of the millions of chords. I mean, you could just Google the chords the Beatles used and see everything that people shy away from and think are jazz chords. I'm not yeah. gonna play it because it's a jazz chord. It's like, <laughs> you're missing out on some yeah. really rich information. It's like tasty food, you know, like really yeah. good tasty food, not just bland yeah. stuff. Play with the well, chords. Yes, and, and we put labels on things in order to tame them. Mm. But, but, you know, in order to make them something that we can understand. But we don't need to put labels on things. I mean, you know, it, if you want to, I mean, fusion, I've always said, is creativity. Because mm. when you put peanut butter together with jelly, it's a different thing. <laughs> you know, you, you, so so therefore any kind of fusion can work if you have a story to tell if you have a point to make and uh, and i think that's that's a really really important concept for people to take on board and, how would you uh, train people to just listen to the song and play the song because i've had a couple of people recently say to me well what style is this i don't know how to accompany you 
what style is this? Like, if it isn't jazz, if it isn't pop, if it isn't Latin, if it isn't like they don't know, exactly. they don't know what to play. And I heard Jeff Beck, uh, not Jeff Beck, uh, Jeff Lynn say it best recently in one of his specials that was on the BBC that I just recently saw. And he said, I like pop music because it's all the styles. And I thought, that's perfect. That's perfect. Right. You know, yeah. like maybe that's why a lot of my music is a combination of styles because it's it is pop true. rock. You know, I thought that was a really great definition of it. Yes, but it's very good. React to the song, play something that fits the song. Exactly. And and I, you know, as a as a professional arranger for all these years, one of the, my jobs has always been to come into a musical situation which is already to a certain extent composed. Mm -hmm. And then they say, what do you think? What does it need? And so I have to identify because I can put those labels on say, okay, what, what he's done there is X and what he's done there is Y, what he's done there is, you know, whatever, but I need to identify it. And then I need to say, well, here, this is the thing that I would do with it. Mm. You know, and it's either a additive or subtractive. Sometimes I say, take, take that away because it's cluttering up this, you know, and this, this instrument here is getting in the way of the voice. So why do you have it there? Yeah, you know, that's not good. You know, so I do this a lot with backing vocals. You know, people think that they, it, but I don't like anything that distracts from the lead vocal. I just don't. Mm -hmm. like and, it, and and historically, it's never been successful to have things that distract from the lead vocal. Yeah. So I, I definitely do that. And but I mean, that's my job. And that, so it's a combination of people coming up with things intuitively, and then helping them with intellect. You know, it's the, the the joining of the intellect. Say, hey, Mr. Intellect, here, meet Miss Creativity, and now you can get together. And mm -hmm. that's, that's the fun part of it for me. Um, well, you but did I the love that. You, you did the arrangement for Sowing the Seeds of Love. I mean, that was enormous. What did they have before you got a hold of it? They had a, an amazing. incredible track, which was, you know, kind of a, a Ringo style drum program that was, yeah, all that, but, yeah. but, on, but on acid, you know, and that's, I mean, that was the thing that they said to me, they, I, you know, I said, why didn't you just get George Martin to do this? Cause it's obviously a Beatles pastiche, but they said, well, we wanted you to do it because then it would be George Martin on acid. <laughs> So, so I said, okay, I get what you mean. Because, I mean, I, I had a reputation by that time as being a wild and crazy guy in the studio. Yeah. So that's what I did. And, and I mean, if you look at, I've been so fortunate to be able to do incredible, I mean, Slave to the Rhythm. You know, that is just, there still has never been a record that is as production-wise and conception-wise as wildly creative as that record. I think that still stands as the height of record production at, at that time. And, and of course, there's also two aspects of record production, which I think is very important because, you know, there's the technology side of record production, and then there's the artistic side. Now, I, I have a course that I've written, which nobody will let me teach, but it's a completely non-technology uh, production course. It's about working with musicians and how to get the best uh, performances, how to guide them to the best compositions, how to help them with their lyrics, how to, you know, how to help them with their general sound, how to help them as artists. And I think that's a big thing that, that producers do. That's something produced like a pro would want, probably. Yeah, that maybe. We'll see it. Well, my new yeah. course is coming out soon. And, and, uh, <laughs> There, I was, I was, uh, I was asked to do something which I've never done before, which is to talk about arranging, but not to mention anything technical, <laughs> anything music, you know, no musical notes, no chords, no, no scores, no, no yeah. dots. And that was a tremendous well, your other course would be better. <laughs> but, but I'm going to tell you, I'm really proud of that course, because <laughs> I definitely figured out a way to explain <laughs> some of the even most sophisticated things about arranging without talking about you know music theory yeah that's and i think cool. it will be a real help to ordinary young people who are you know wanting to get into arranging absolutely i'm looking forward to it myself it, it's 
tell us any Paul stories. You were going to tell us some Paul stories, but you're not allowed to probably. No, no, no. I am allowed to. I'm going to tell you one thing about Paul that I think a lot of people, when I first started working with him, I was told by everybody I knew who had worked with him, oh, mm -hmm. you know, be very, very careful because Paul is a control freak. <laughs> he, he won't let you do anything and and you know he wants to be in control the whole time he wants to have all it's all going to be his ideas nothing could be farther from the truth <laughs> when i started working with him it was like okay what do you want to do about this great okay that sounds good why not uh, yeah sure mm. and 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 i found him absolutely creative in that respect everybody who we hired everybody who we we worked with he gave them their creative head i mean obviously mm -hmm. he didn't like something he'd say it but but man he he, no, he he was so supportive and so willing to let other people be creative and it's kind of like what you were talking about earlier the fact mm -hmm. that he he encouraged that and with me you know he just let me do whatever i felt was the cool thing to do at the time and so that that in itself, I mean, my, my coolest Paul McCartney story is really just that one day when we were working on something or we were right in the middle of it, he said, hey, guys, uh, do you mind if I just I've got an idea for a song. Do you mind if I stop? And you're going to say no to Paul McCartney? I don't think so. So he got <laughs> it. he went into the studio. And of course, this is down, you know, at the windmill place where he has and uh, he picks up a guitar and sings this song all the way through perfectly and then he says okay um i i think i'll just put some drums on it and he goes over to the drum kit plays perfect drums for it then he says oh well i've gone this far i might as well pick up the bass he gets the hoffner beetle bass with the set list still stuck on it yeah. uh, from, from uh, shea stadium and right. he plays, plays bass on it but then he sits down and he says, oh, well, I'll put a little piano part on. He puts the piano on. And this is one take each. And he's just thought of the song. <laughs> and then he said to me, OK, well, that's probably enough. Could you could you give Dick Morrissey a call? Because, you know, he's my favorite sax player. And I'd, I hear a little tenor sax on this. So so uh, could you get him to come tomorrow? Sure. And that was it. And I think that really sums up the incredible uh, mastery of this guy. And what song was it? Um, I, I've got to tell you that it's a song that I don't think has ever been released, but oh. it was really nice. <laughs> a very nice tune. And I, 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 I've got to look, there is a big book of everything he's ever recorded. And I've got to go, go back and look at that to see if it was ever recorded, but I can't remember the title of it. I remember it's, the story you told me uh, when I first got in touch with you, he was writing something on piano. And he said, Richard, Richard, I don't know how to get back to this key. What do I do? Oh, yeah, that was a, that's a good story, too. Thanks for reminding me. Tell, tell the rest of that one. Yeah. So <laughs> he he said, I've, I've got to finish this song or else Linda won't give me dinner. <laughs> she's, she's told me she's so sick of me trying to figure out how to modulate back to the original key. <laughs> I just can't figure out a way to do it. Now, this also shows that Paul understood about modulation, you know, and he said, I've, I've tried putting the five chord in here, but it doesn't work. It just sounds like crap, you know, and then he said, I tried using this chord and I tried to, and he played me all the different things. And he said, I just don't know what, what I'm going to do. And I said, well, Paul, add two beats, <laughs> quite a slow balladish type of thing. And so he went, Blang, gong, dang, gong, dang, one, two. And then I said, start again. <laughs> and, it, and he played it. He says, oh, that sounds good. Why does that work? And I said, because if you're in a situation like that and you stop the chord and let it hang, it's like an end and a new beginning. And man, I mean, <laughs> that was, and it, of course, I knew that would work because I've done it before, but he had never tried that particular little idea of doing it and i said and it's a beautiful melody and you want it to come back anyway so nobody's going to question it yeah. and he said oh, it sounds good great thank god i get dinner tonight that's you know? great well that's the thing i feel like the creative process is the most coolest thing 
that human beings can play with. And we all have it for whatever we're interested in doing and using it for. And this stuff seems to happen by magic. You get this idea, you get this something rolling, something's happening. You've explored, you've expressed, you've played with chords, some melody has happened, you've got something going and you're not really even sure what you're making yet. Cause it's not like we all come with manuals and it's not like no. the, you've got the box top picture of the puzzle you're making. You just have a bunch of pieces and you know somehow they're gonna fit together. And you have to have that curiosity and that patience and that stick to to see it through to turn it into something. And then all of a sudden you realize, oh, it's a yeah. bossa nova, of course, I should do this. Or of course it needs two beats extra there. And, oh, of course this modulation will work if I do such and such. But for a while it's evasive because, or elusive, right? You know, because it's, it's, it's still coming into focus. It's still blurry right. right yet. You don't even know. And yet. the stick to itiveness is a really important word that you use there because a lot of people give up. And, and and they don't, I mean, and a, a lot of people have always asked me over the years, what's your biggest inspiration? And I say, a deadline. <laughs> it, it, that's simple, you know, because I, I have had 50 years of a mm. life of people calling up and saying, you know, I, I need I need a six piece brass arrangement by tomorrow morning and it's four <laughs> o'clock in the afternoon. You know, that's the kind of thing it is. With, with McCartney, my very first job for him, was to write two big band arrangements for him. I was given the music on the Thursday oh night. That's a, bit, that's a whole long story too. But yeah. nevertheless, that, that deadline made me write. Wow. And that's always the way it, it is. And uh, um, I think mm -hmm. that it's such a beautiful thing that students need to learn is to have a deadline. And, and that's why I say to them, if you're late with the assignment, you get a zero. <laughs> because you can't there is no there is no you know in the professional world there's no uh second chance you've got to be at the studio at nine in the morning because there's a 60 piece orchestra st sitting there <laughs> and they all got to be paid and the studio's got to be paid and you got to be there with the music and yeah. so that's been my life for 50 years so um, you commit and you show up <laughs> Yeah, that's right. Well, yeah, so that's why there's so much of my teaching that has everything to do with brain training and 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 like life lessons, because right. when you don't have all this right, you can't tune yourself and you can't show up and then you've got nothing to give. And it's like, why didn't you take care of yourself? You know, you have yeah. to sleep, you have to eat, you have to dress, you have to clean yourself, you, you have to take care of those things. And then you can take care of your mind and your heart and you can fulfill yourself uh, artistically. And then you've got something to share. You've got something to give. You've got something to, to collaborate with, you know? The answer to everything is be prepared. Yeah. That's it. But anyway, that's all great. And God, it's been so great talking with you, Lauren. And I, I just want to thank you so much for this. And and also, if you want to use this for your videos, that's good for that's fine. Please do. Um, no, because it's it actually this is the best I've ever heard anyone sound playing music and singing on Zoom. But anyway, that's that's it. And I'm still impressed with your guitar. It sounds so beautiful, really. It really does. It's it's they, a little bit to make them in those days. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they knew how to make them in those days. Well, I I, I can't wait till we can do something together. I would, I would love to do something together. So Yeah. If you have a song that you wanna kind of do something with, let's let's do it. Arrange I have ideas for harmonies for you. Yeah, cool. Yeah, I wanna stay away from your voice and get up higher or lower and just make a different voicing make something happen yeah yeah or if you're writing something and you want to bat it my way and say finish this or uh yeah well what whatever you think we should do something though that's that's yeah. lovely and marvelous yeah i would love to all right yeah i know and it's really disappointing everybody wants to get up to bat and nobody wants to play the field yeah <laughs> very good you've got a lot of good sayings lauren <laughs> Write them all down. Long. Have you written a book yet of your of your you know thoughts about music and stuff? I have two little uh, e-books out that Amazon prints once in a while. One is uh, you know guitar insights, myths, and what matters. And there's some of those right. kinds of things in there for sure. But um, I'll check yeah. it out. Yeah. So okay, Lauren, you're wonderful. That's all I can say. Oh, thank you, Richard.
<laughs> You're the I mean, I could sit and look at you in your studio all day long because I'm, I'm looking at every, oh, I'd love to play with that. And oh, I want to press that button there. <laughs> You've got such cool stuff there. They have a really nice piano and a whole bunch of amps and a whole. Yeah, yeah, I haven't even seen one of these in place, but it's, it's great. Yeah. Okay, well, we'll talk soon. All righty. All right. Sounds Thanks good. very much. Thank you, too. Hey, okay, lots of love. Bye-bye. Ciao.